to the awesome House Council. This guy, the War Thief, Kyle Smith. This is like what, the seventh ground talk or so? <laughs> are mine as well, but I've been thinking about these other questions, and I hope you'll be able to provide some cool feedback. First, just some stories. At an Indonesian Nike factory, they throw shoes at me, they slap me in the face, they call me dog, monkey, and pig. Do I file a complaint? No. They'll fire me like they fire the others. We are powerless, and our only choice is to stay and suffer or speak out and be fired. A supervisor at this plant ordered six female workers to stand out in the blazing sun after they failed to meet the target of completing 60 dozen pairs of Nike shoes. They stood outside for two hours crying before they were let back in um, to continue their jobs. This is a video of <clears throat> a coach, a former coach of the St. John's soccer team who, um, upon hearing about the Nike's possible endorsement of his team, refused to wear any Nike materials uh, and was therefore fired. Looking into these things, because he's a devout Catholic, he was studying theology, uh, he went to live among the Indonesian Nike workers for a month, living on their pay of $1.25 uh, $1 per day. States, a little bit closer by, West Virginia and Kentucky. Another industry is the coal industry. It's the industry that Appalachians depend on, but at the same time it's the industry that destroys a lot of everything else. The opportunity for any tourism is they destroy the drinking water, or they destroy the, the streams, the mountains, and in disaster after disaster, mudslides, pollution, spills, they destroy the homes. <coughs> it's also an industry that supplies part of our power here. 
Here's some quotes from the residents of West Virginia and Kentucky. This is insane. This is completely insane. Processing coal leaves behind sludge ponds around Appalachia. And they spill. This time, it was, this time, it was 300 million gallons of thick black sludge. Aquatic life wiped out for 100 miles of river. Residents who can no longer drink their groundwater. We've gone through all the official channels of every level of state government, and we've been to D.C. where nothing is being done. You've air pollution, water pollution, and the destruction of so many living things. It's a bigger deal than people think. It's the destruction of culture. A statistic. Babies born to mothers who smoke during pregnancy have an 18% chance, or 18% higher risk of birth defects. However, babies born to mothers who live in areas with mountaintop removal mining have a 26% higher rate of birth defects. Another quote. Exactly what is wrong with the coal mining today is right here at this school, where you have a 2.8... This is a spill. This next image is of a 2.8 billion gallon coal slurry pond that is right above that elementary school. But at the same time, you'll hear things from West Virginians and Kentuckians and people of Appalachia like this. If we didn't have coal mining, we wouldn't have lights, and we wouldn't have plastic, and we wouldn't have rubber to put on our shoes or our cars, and we wouldn't have jobs. Now we move to southwest Florida, the agricultural fields, where migrant workers are paid 50 cents, a, uh, $50 a day for carrying two tons of tomatoes. That's 40 cents, roughly, for 32 pounds. Um, that bucket that I carried there. <clears throat> Lucas's promised affordable accommodation turned out to be the back of a box truck shared with two or three other workers. There was no running water or toilet, so occupants urinated and defecated in the corners. For these accommodations, his boss docked Lucas's pay by $20 a week. Cold showers from a garden hose in the backyard were $5 each, and Lucas was soon $300 in debt. After a month of 10-hour workdays, he figured he would have paid off that debt. But when Lucas asked, his boss threatened to beat him should he ever try to leave. And over the years, the boss deprived him of $55,000. Taking a day off was not an option. If Lucas became ill or was too exhausted to work, he was kicked in the head, beaten, and locked in the back of the truck. Other members of the dozen-man crew were slashed with knives, tied to posts, posts, and shackled in chains. But on November 18, 2007, Lucas was again locked inside the truck. But as dawn broke, he noticed a faint light shining through the hole in the roof. Jumping up, he secured a handhold and punched himself through, and he was free. This is Southwest Florida, or as a federal prosecutor recently put it, speaking of 1,000 slaves, migrants, freed since 1997, ground zero for modern day slavery. These places, these work conditions are not just the ones I've shown you. These are the shrimp factories where passports are taken from workers, these Cambodians going to Thailand, so they cannot leave, and that was the crucial piece of evidence for making the case for human trafficking. This is the same factories where they too were not given enough bathroom access, and so they urinated and defecated in the corners. These are the Chinese mines for rare earth minerals, the crucial pieces for <coughs> iPhones, the camera, this computer, hybrid vehicles, a lot of different technology. Those same mines uh, which because of the pollution of the groundwater, have forced entire villages to move because they can't drink that groundwater anymore. They cannot grow their crops anymore. These are also sweatshops in Los Angeles supplying clothes to Urban Outfitters, TJ Maxx, Ross, Burlington Coat Factory, you name it. And these are the polluted and impoverished wetlands in the Niger River Delta. 
where oil spills have wiped out the fish stocks that these villages once depended on. There are a lot of parallels between the Niger River Delta and Appalachia. It's the one industry that dominates and destroys everything else. All of these are either quotes or adopted from reports. So the question, the question is why? And on the flip side, who is responsible? first people we can obviously look to is the government. The, they have the formal responsibility to handle human trafficking, labor problems, environmental problems, whatever. But what can anyone do to stop foreign governments? Now maybe, or to foreign companies from doing these things. Perhaps it's just an Indonesian problem is an Indonesian problem, and a Thai problem is a Thai problem. We can sign petitions, but what else can we do? In the U.S., we have democracy. We have the Environmental Protection Agency. Justice. We have human rights groups. We have environmental groups. They're all doing these things, working on these things. But really, it seems like if the corporations didn't do these things in the first place, then we wouldn't ever need to hear about any of this. Corporations are million and billion dollar organizations that really do create everything in our world. Our food, our water, our energy. This university's enormous endowment because this university invests in those companies so that they can provide everything we enjoy here. They're the ones who both cause these problems and also the ones who have the power to stop them. They can create better working conditions, pollute less, pay workers more. I'm not justifying them, but they're really constrained. First, they're obligated to deliver the best dividends to their shareholders, the people who, in essence, own the company and vote on its board of directors, who in turn determine policy. Two, they have to pay employees, the rest of the employees, who have families to feed and have lives to live. Third, they need to pay their executives enormous salaries so they can find the most talented people to run these companies and stay competitive in the market. And four, to stay competitive in the market, they have to deliver the best, most blemish-free, roundest tomato, tasteless tomato, to the consumer at the cheapest price, or the shiniest shoes on the coolest basketball player, so that we can buy them. <coughs> if they don't, they will sink under the flashier and cheaper companies. So in this, in this whole economics of, of corporations, labor is almost always the most expensive component. So companies look for ways to drive these costs into the ground, to crush them into the ground. To take these costs that we might be paying in higher prices and externalize them to the indignity of the workers, to the health care the healthcare costs of people in polluted areas. What happened? Polluted communities. This is why we go to the polls. In a capitalist system, we've got to vote for stricter regulations to control the self-interest of greedy corporations who will underpay and neglect their employees or destroy our ecosystem. That's why Americans spent $6 billion on federal elections last year, and why our news media pays so much attention to candidates, their stances, and the government. So that we can cast our 1 in 126 million slice of influence in a presidential election, or 1 in 1 6 millionth in a senatorial election in North Carolina, North Carolina. So that these legislators and the government can tax us to set up agencies to combat and clean up after the companies that supply everything in the world that we live in. I feel like there's some big misunderstanding here. What about the votes that we cast every day? We have ballots, and I would say probably most of us vote. But on the one hand, we vote for clean air, and then in the winter, right now, against clean air. This thing is running almost every day that I come back. But in the winter, I, I don't completely understand but It's true. We vote against labor violations. I don't know why it's so long. <laughs> <laughs> we vote against labor violations. And then we vote for horrible factories. These, these clothes are probably On top of that, we vote for 
bountiful ecosystems and clean water and health. But then we vote against clean energy by not really thinking too much about driving. I think some of us do, but for most of us, it's, you know, it's, we're kind of on autopilot. I think there's two ideas of consumerism in the capitalist system. In the first one, we, we envision ourselves at the bottom. We're the happy consumer. We get all of our stuff. And above us, we have Nike, Shell, Apple. We give them our dollars, they give us our products. And they get their products in these factories, in these industrial fields, in these mines, who in turn get their labor from workers in their communities. And so, above all that, we have the government. And we send them, <coughs> can you guys see that? <coughs> well, we send them our votes and our tax dollars so that they can take care of these people and these factories and these companies. But I think there might be a better way to see this. Think about it. At the bottom, you have workers in their communities, people at the very bottom. Above them, you have the industrial fields, <coughs> mines, factories. And above them, you have Nike and Shell and Apple. And they buy their products, they contract out, they get this stuff. And then they deliver products to the happy consumer. We exert a downward force on these corporations to lower prices, to squeeze as much out of these factories as they can, who in turn push down on people and ecosystems and communities. And over here, let's say we have the government, the US government even. We pay them our tax dollars and our votes so that they can lift these people off these factories. And they can lift these factories off these people and lift these workers out of the ground. That's one way to consider. on coal smokestacks or those sorts of things. Did that all make sense? Please, actually, yeah, interrupt me if you have any questions. Might be not completely clear. But um, I think there might be a perception of corporations as puppet masters. The ones controlling everything, they're the ones in power. And if they're the puppet masters, are we not the ones applauding? or even buying the tickets. Another thing I'm wondering is what would happen if we diverted the six billion dollars, all the money spent on elections, all the attention spent on elections, at least some of it, to corporations and creating some kind of transparency that would allow us to know exactly what we're buying in the world and what we're voting for with our dollars. So that when we walked into the store with this information, we could turn off autopilot take a look at, for example, those two tomatoes, one that says fair trade and one that says made in USA. And we look at the difference between those two prices, 50 cents per pound, maybe a dollar per pound. And we can ask ourselves, is that the price of dignity? Or is that the price of a safer world or cleaner ecosystems? Could we turn these sorts of ideas into our new autopilot? We knew exactly where our money went. 
What if we could know it was not just companies that beat their workers and pollute water, but paid living wages and invested in communities? There are definitely challenges to this way of thinking. There are a lot of people who cannot afford to give up certain products, who cannot afford to buy alternatives. So perhaps it's imperative on us, those of us who can afford the difference, to do so. Because if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? At the same time, we're still just an individual consumer. What can we do? Well, just like we're individual voters, what if one of us formed a party around, not a political party, but a consumer block that leveraged their power with corporations, kind of dueled with them in a way? What if the psychologists, future psychologists among us, help to connect social marketing with conscious consumers? Or what if the economist devised a better way of ethical con consumption? Or so on. There's a, there's a thousand ways to go about this, policymakers, etc. What if a student group at every campus in the United States pushed their university to buy better food? Which is something that we're doing here on Duke's campus. And considering that tomorrow is in honor of Martin Luther King Jr., I think a quote from him would be extremely illustrative. If you cannot fly, then run. And if you cannot run, then walk. And if you cannot walk, then crawl. Because there are things that we can do. And so, perhaps when you walk into a store next time, or you go to the Kohl's, or you're thinking about your studies or a career you could pursue, think about yourself as a consumer as well. And the question is, what can we do? So that's about it. Any questions or comments? Oh, also, one other thing, <laughs> one other thing, another idea, perhaps for programmers, is to devise an application that, anal that compiles and analyzes all of a person's purchases as to where they go and whom they're supporting. So, you know, breaking it down by organic, breaking it down by uh, labor violations, breaking it down by contributing to Democrats or Republicans, things like that. I basically, basically, I want to make the point that there are things that we can do, but what are they? Any ideas? that are actually owned by the workers? For example, like Duke Credit Union, yeah. the credit cards, things of that nature. So like cooperatives. Mm. I think that's awesome. In, uh, there are a lot of cooperatives around, especially like uh, Weaver Street Market and Chapel Hill, where the owners are also people who shop there. So they get a small <coughs> dividend, but they also are the people shopping and working there so that they have control over the company. I think it's pretty there's also a benefit corporation, which is a type of corporation that, as opposed to being chartered simply to meet the needs of the shareholders and the lowest prices, in its charter it has to meet a public interest. So it kind of balances the, the wishes of the shareholders. I think Maryland, Duel's phone, and other places um, have adopted laws recognizing those things. <coughs> Stewardship Council are just three of the hundreds out there. Um, they're kind of revolutionizing it in some ways, but at the same time, we still need to make sure that these certifications like free range or cage free actually mean anything, because a lot of times they can be greenwashing, which means just kind of making it look like they're doing well, but they're not. Um, so I'm wondering, I guess, your opinion on it given your presentation. So are you saying that um, you would prefer 
like more more like like written out regulations for companies and for corporations instead of um, instead of like letting the companies like do things on their own like like more more detailed like government having a hand in corporations. I don't want to be like, you got, don't raise your hand if you want. You know, like just, just go out there, like this is a conversation. Um, I think it really depends on the case because with the pharmaceutical industry, it's really, really hard to know all those chemicals and how to deal with them and what it's going to do to my body. So without that sort of information, the consumer really does perhaps need the role of the hand of the government to protect them. But in other places, like the energy industry, we have a lot, a lot of more sway where we don't necessarily need to govern through the government. We can govern through our own choices, if that makes any sense. Another thing to consider is that in places like the Niger River Delta and like Appalachia, and places where there's only these, these factories to work at, um, boycotts, on the one hand, would signal the, con the, the corporation that consumers don't like this, but it may also deprive a lot of people of jobs. So, what is, I think the best question is, what is the balance between government intervention and ethical consumption, knowledge of the consumer, and the threat of boycott, perhaps, or other sorts of techniques that might pressure companies to change? Any other ideas? Any things that you guys have, like, disagreed with? I'm wondering if um, do you think the value of organic or healthy um, products is more important than like um, have, like having workers have like ethical um, lead ethical lives and like have ethical standards for the workers because a lot of like unorganic genetically engineered crops they may be considered not like organic but they make like they make it easier for companies to grow those crops. So you're asking about GMOs and like can that like because GMOs and organic are two things. Yeah. Organic, I don't think can you, actually don't quote me on that. Well, um, I'm just wondering whether you think like the the value the, yeah, the treatment of the worker outweighs the value yeah. to the consumer. Yeah. That's up to you. <laughs> I think one of the biggest the theme throughout this is just information about these products. What it's not just the qualities within the product, but the qualities without invisible things. And so as a consumer, you get to make that choice. Does the organic nature of it, that may actually pre expose you to less pesticides, or the local nature of it, which is a whole lot fresher, a lot more nutritious, outweigh the way that it was made? I think just better information will make a more efficient economy, which is actually a, a, a concept in economics. The more information out there, the better the decisions will be. But, I mean, we go through our lives without about our products, or do you think that the government has a responsibility to educate the consumer? Probably depends on the product. Like in the pharmaceutical industry or the healthcare industry, it's hard to determine all those things. But it also depends on how you're defining ourselves. So for example, you guys might be able to tell this is something I might want to study or go into or something like that. I really want to put together a program that will allow people to really understand X percentage of my purchases and my dollars went to this company, and Y percentage went to, you know, companies that are supporting Democratic candidates or something like that. And once you know those, like, if other people, if I can help other people make better decisions, then that's one way I can contribute. I think that perhaps, you know, some big things, like, if you really disagree with what Nike does, you simply don't buy Nike. Or you write a letter to them, just like you might write a letter to legislators or something like that, because corporations pay attention to that kind of stuff. <laughs> they don't like consumers. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's ways to contribute outside of just your own little purchases, but I think that's also an important component. I'm wondering, um, I completely agree with essentially everything you're saying, um, but like, I'm 
always thinking of like the repercussions kind of thing, like the indirect repercussions. Um, so let's say in a beautiful world, the companies and the corporations don't have as terrible labor conditions and they pay their workers more, use better supplies and all that. Would, do you feel like that would then trickle down to then the price of the product for the consumer, for like what we see in the store on the price tag? And then that would in turn affect, and I'm just using America as an example, of the American economy or household economies where like then they have to pay more for like, if you buy organic food for groceries, it doubles the price of weekly grocery food or like clothes, like essentially everything. So like, wouldn't that then be an indirect cost on us? Yeah. Yes. Which obviously is selfish, but at the same time, like, we have families that we need to exactly. support too. Exactly. I think that's a really, I think that's one of the key questions. You know, what, I think it really comes down to just cost benefit. You know, what is the value of this, the way it was grown? to exactly what's in the product for the price. One really interesting example is about 30, 40 years ago, um, a, a, a particular secretary of agriculture helped to revolutionize American agriculture. He helped to industrialize American agriculture by consolidating these large farms, a certain type of subsidy program that basically subsidizes our corn. And um, at, that, at that time, there were percentage of income that a family would typically, an American family would spend on food was much, much higher than it is today. So as a portion of our income, we pay a whole lot less on food. What, what effects? And that's the question. Do we, what outweighs what? Does the cheaper price outweigh <coughs> the fields and fields and fields of corn? The very, very cheap calories? The one-fourth of all products typically in a, in a grocery store that are made of some sort of corn byproduct because there's such a huge supply of it. Um, to me, I, I think that this is, on the one hand, it is this kind of like government, like big government thing, something you might associate with like bleeding heart liberals. At the same time, it's also something that's associated with the more conservative ideology of personal responsibility. And I think that like, there's different ways that people will interpret it, but more information is always going to be better. And understanding your role as a consumer, power as a consumer. I think to go off of that, maybe it's just playing devil's advocate a little bit, but I don't think it's government's responsibility to educate us about what we buy. It's not the purpose of government. It's our own responsibility to educate ourselves, I like guess, consumers about what we buy. I mean, the information is certainly out there. As you found all this, and I think it's just like stuff like this that like, I, I didn't know a lot of that stuff. So it's like people like this taking the initiative to maybe show people the, the sad things that they didn't see, more than like the government setting up, you know, ten agencies that are gonna waste billions of dollars in regulating this stuff and then really Right. And I think at the same time, like to piggyback on that, if you are a consumer trying to like get the government to, to intervene on some stuff, one it, it's hard to be effective because you're not getting at the root of this, which is consumer demand. It all comes down to that. And that's what we have the direct effect on. I think it's a cool way to unite left and right. I had another thing I wanted to say about the management company, the, the company that runs uh, the Great Hall on West and Marketplace and manages some other ones. Um, the, re, the Food for Thought group on campus, which we have some awesome members in the room, hey, 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 um, <laughs> is working on a project called the Real Food Calculator, where we are going through the invoices of these companies, or this company, and categorizing their product, their purchases. At some point, we'll be able to say, Duke has X percentage of sustainable, fair, local, real food on campus. Just from my look, like just from looking at some of those purchases, like I'm just gonna say roughly we might have like, let's say they have like 20% real food, which is actually a really, really good number. They still get stuff from US Foods, which buys all these sorts of products, these the 
tomatoes, the corn, what have you. But there's a reason they can't do any better. I mean, we all know people complain about marketplace. They don't do, do enough. And that's, that's a separate argument. Perhaps they could be doing better with their, the money they have. But um, they're trying. But they can do only so much given the constraints that we set for them. So do you think the key is to encouraging people that they just have to pay more? Um, because, I mean, people would get angry if we wanted to raise our student learning fees. So we talked about this in the group thought. Yeah. Meaning, I mean, it, it seems like everything boils down to convincing the consumer that they need to care about this and be willing to pay for it. But like, I have a twin brother, for instance, who he's very educated about food because I'm his sister and I'm very, <laughs> I'm very into it. And I like tell him, oh, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't buy that or you shouldn't eat that. But he 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 knows about it. But he he's I'm not paying more for you know whatever that is that whole wheat bun at the grocery store. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to buy the one dollar you know white bread. So I mean, how can, it seems like there needs to be a paradigm shift, but I don't see how that's ever going to actually. That's the big question. Our, it's, it's a question of value. If we believe in these things, I guess the people that I really want to reach are the people not who, who don't care. Perhaps some of these images, some of these stories would help people to care I, because I think it's important. And that goes into a discussion of factual knowledge versus emotional knowledge and having both of those, which I think is the role of artists and marketers and policymakers all together, interdisciplinary. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's also, I'm trying to reach the people who would vote for these things, who would have the government tax everybody to make these things happen. Because we pay for them anyway. Some of these things we pay for in higher health care costs, cost, which I think the argument can be made that the cheap, cheap price of a lot, a lot of, pro of food could be linked to that. So we end up paying in other ways. The EPA has to, has to clean it. They do fine these companies, but they also have to tax us to clean up after some of these things, which are the effects of our purchases. In response to what you were saying, I, I don't really think it's a matter of making people, at least this is how I think it, I don't think it's a matter of making people care more about it. I almost think it's like, if you make those products more available. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, like, maybe not... Like, push them more so yeah, like, people see them more? I don't know, because I feel like there's there's the whole thing of, like, it's so easy to buy yeah. the cheap stuff. It's so easy to, like, do it just because it's so <coughs> available. But, like, if you reverse it and make... That's the whole thing with, like... That's what we talk about, about, like, food deserts and the real thing. <coughs> like, how it's so easy to find, like, if you go to a, you know, local grocery store, it's so easy to find the cheap stuff, but if you really want to find, like, an organic brand of something, you have to go to some sort of specialty store. So you're right, totally. There's a real issue with, with the economics of it. If you increase the demand for a product, say organic, the law of demand, supply, some law of economics, <laughs> I just was learning about this, whatever, the price will go up. But at the same time, there, there are kind of two things that could happen from there. One, you create economies of scale. That when you have enough people wanting a certain product in a certain way, then you will create companies that, that build themselves on that and are able to offer a lower price for the product because then they will increase, so increase the demand. Demand goes up, price goes down. What did I say? So when, when price is high, 
out and decide that we want organic paper or something. <laughs> Companies will notice that and be like, oh, we can, we can supply it at a higher price and get more profits. But then there'll be more organic paper available. They will, they will increase the price and also the supply. And then we will say, oh, the price goes up, fewer people will buy it. Then it's this, it's this like balancing thing. <coughs>
people, profits, and employment, where all these things are, are into consideration. So it's not just all about raising the price on consumers who demand it more, but possibly offering better products. So thank you everybody for coming. I really, really, really appreciated this conversation. I loved it.